Let's all stand, yes. We're going to start by singing and worshiping our God together. The lion and the lamb. The one who goes before us in every battle. The one who's working for us, for you and I right now. Even as we speak, even as we sing together. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kings. your heart and gratitude towards him. Sing these 
Father, God, we bring to you our hallelujahs. They might be halfway hallelujah. They might be broken hallelujahs. They might be whispered hallelujahs. Faint, not even strength to it, but we bring it to you right now in this room. You know what each and every one of us needs right here. You know how we walked into this room. You know the desires and needs of our hearts. God, we acknowledge fully that you are the one who provides. That you are the one who we cast 
every anxiety, every anxiety and fear and care onto you. You are the one. You have the answers. You have the directions. So we just thank you in advance that you are this God for us. A God worth trusting, a God worth running to, a God worth just, just pouring our hearts to. You care. And that alone, and that alone is reason enough to be grateful. You are a Father who cares for us. Father, our Holy Spirit, I just pray that you do a work in our hearts. Let gratitude rise up from the deepest places this morning, from the most hidden places. Give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear. There's so much. There are a million little miracles that followed us and will continue to follow us through your grace, through your love, through your mercy, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Hey, welcome to Venice Church. So glad that you're here. We love that you've joined us. If this is your first time with us, a very special welcome to you. I'm um, so glad to have you here. Now, before you have a seat, you know what to do. Turn and say hey to a couple of folks that you did not come here with. Good morning, everybody. Enjoying this sunny weather. We finally got sun in LA. It's a crazy thing. If we haven't met, I'm Holly, and I have a few announcements before we jump into today's message. So first, tonight is night of worship. Night of worship. There we go. I always promised I wouldn't do that, but you guys deserved it. Um, so if you haven't been, it's about an hour. We sing, we pray, we just come together and worship. So I really, if you haven't been, I want to encourage you, you know, it's, it's one hour, and I promise you will not regret coming. So that's tonight at 6 right here. Um, we hope to see you there. And for those who have been, I know I'm going to see you again because it's amazing and you're not going to miss it. So tonight, 6 o'clock, right here. Uh, and then next Sunday, we have our Starting Steps class. So maybe you're new to Venice and want to learn more. Maybe you've been coming a while and want to become a member of the church. This is how you do that. So let's be clear. Coming to this class does not make you a member. It just gives you that information. So if you want to take that step, you can. So I would encourage you to check it out. You can scan the QR code above me to get more information. But it will be next Sunday after second service. Lunch will be provided. So you learn about the church and we feed you. One of the things you learn about the church, we feed you a lot. So there you go. Um, so that is next Sunday after second service. And then we're really excited because we now have our beach baptism scheduled. So we're going to do these at Dockweiler. This is where we've been the last two years, uh, Lifeguard Tower 54. So if you would like to be baptized, this is a wonderful opportunity to take that next step in your faith. So maybe you've been baptized and you've recommitted your life. Maybe you've never been baptized. This, guys, I just, I don't want to gloss over this. This is a huge step in your faith. And we want to take that with you. And this is a fabulous day. We have tents. We have food. Like I said, we feed you a lot. Um, we have food. We have games. And we go out and we come together as a church community. And we celebrate with those that are taking this step. So it's a fun day. So two things to take away. If you haven't gotten baptized, great time to do it. If you have gotten baptized, come, hang out, eat, celebrate, make a fun day of it. Got a little QR code up here. You, they tested it. They said you can scan it. So we, we do ask if you can um, to go ahead and register if you know that you're going to get baptized. Um, you can register day of. I don't want to dissuade anybody. But if you know you're like, I'm doing this, go ahead and register. You can also go to venice.church slash events and you'll see everything we have coming up and you can click on the different events there to register for them as well there. So lots of good stuff coming up. We're excited about that. Um, and next, last week we talked about the house build in Mexico that's going to be happening in November. So we have a video we want to show you guys to give you a better feel for that. For those in need in Mexico, every year, Teams from our movement of churches come together for a weekend to build an entire home. Over the course of the trip, 
the team comes together to bring hope to a special family in need. This wonderful experience ends up changing everyone involved. Thanks to the Christmas offering, a well-deserving family is able to drastically improve its quality of life. These trips have been happening for many years, and together our movement of churches has contributed to building dozens of homes in Mexico. We are thankful for this opportunity to help spread help, hope, and love. So I decided to come on this house bill because we have been given so much. Everyone who gives to the Christmas offering plays a part in giving these families a home. Whether you are on site building this home or giving financially to the Christmas offering, you are a huge part of bringing the hope and love of Jesus to many families. For those in need in Mexico. Uh, so it's a super cool experience. They did mention the Christmas offering in the video. So if you've been going here longer than a year, then you heard us talk, or less than a year, I guess. You heard us talk about the Christmas offering um, in the November and December season. So that is what financially pays for the house to be built. So if you gave to the Christmas offering, you helped to build houses. But if you would actually like to physically build the houses, this is where that comes in. So we do, um, the cost is your trip down there and your housing. All the information is on the website. You can scan the QR code. I do want to stress that this fills up very fast. So if you are interested, this is like a sign up today thing, not like I'm going to think about it and sign up in a month because it's going to be full. So you can go to Venice Church House Build. You can scan the QR code or once again, Venice Church Events will have it listed on there as well. But it's November 17th through 19th, but you do need to sign up ASAP. So that is how you are generous with your time. If you would like to be generous with your finances today, you can do so by going to venice.church slash give. You can give through our app. And if you're here in person, we have envelopes in the back and drop boxes around the building. All right, guys, we are back after Father's Day last week. Uh, we are back in our series, Lifeline, A Way of Prayer. So let's jump in. Hey, good morning. So, uh, okay, question. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt completely ill-equipped? How many of you, like, that's an everyday experience for you? You just feel, that's been my life in the ministry for 35 years. I've, I have felt that, where you just don't know what to do or how you're going to do it. I, I remember... The first funeral service, it was a graveside, and, uh, but the whole service was done at the graveside. It wasn't just a, you know, a committal service. It was a funeral service at the graveside, and I was doing an internship at a, a big church in Sacramento, and anyways, one, uh, one family had asked me, would you come and at the, at the service read some scripture? And would you make some comments? Somebody else was doing the main part, but would you read the scripture? And would you make some comments on the scriptures just for everybody? I said, well, I'd be honored to. Again, I'd never done this before. I'm all of, I don't know, 22, 23, maybe something around there. And I get there, and uh, I'm, I'm like, this, it's kind of tense. There's, there's some tension. There's, there's about... 100, 150 people at this thing, and it's, it's tense. And I asked one of the family members who I knew, I said, what's, what's going on around here? And he said, oh, yeah, this, this is a, it's kind of it's kind of a unique situa situation. These are, these are it's, it's, it's about as close as Sacramento has to the mafia. <laughs> and we got two families here. And uh, they're, they're not, they're not uh, copacetic with each other. And so there's, it's crazy, Mark. There's a lot of guns here right now <laughs> at a funeral service and a lot of hostility. And, uh, you know, do your best, huh? <laughs> and I'm like, and I kid you not, and I'm looking around and now I see it, you know? And, and so 
this is, I'm not exaggerating this at all. I get up and I, I got my, my, my spot. I had two different Psalms that I was supposed to read. And so I start reading in the Psalms and I'm, it's my turn. So I go, yes, and the, uh, the Lord will take care of you and the Lord is with you and blessed is he who trusts. And, and I'm so nervous that I lose my place and I can't find where I'm at. And so I, I just start making stuff up. I'm like... And the Lord says from on high to look unto thee, and comest thou unto him, where the dew will drop like rain. Oh, and there I am, and I found my spot again, and I start reading again, and I'm looking, and I'm sweating, and I lost it again. So the cry goes from the hilltop out to thee today. And by the time I'm done with just massacring this beautiful psalm, and now I realize I got a comment on it, I just go, that was really nice and encouraging. <laughs> I, I was scared to death and uh, realized at that point, I don't know what I'm doing. They just asked me to do this because I'm in Bible college and I'm doing an internship and now I'm supposed to know what to do. How many of you ever been in a situation like that? You're like, you thought, you assumed I knew what I was supposed to do, and I don't know what I'm doing. I think that that can be how prayer is for many people. Like, okay, I know I'm supposed to pray, and maybe you have prayed. Maybe you've prayed, and it's just been something simple like, you know, God, thank you for this food, and bless it. Somebody called on you. You were the one they called on at Thanksgiving. And so, you know, you mounted up and went, you know, I, I got this, and you did it. And you're trying to remember all the prayers that you've heard from other people, and you prayed that thing. And How many of you have been in a circle where, like, people are praying, and you know all of a sudden you catch a clue, and you're like, oh, wait, they're taking turns. That means this thing's coming around to me, you know? <laughs> Oh, no. And so now you're, you don't even, you don't even pay at all any attention to what everybody else is praying, right? You're just thinking, okay, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? And then all of a sudden you land on it. You got it. You know what you're going to say. And then the person two people away, they just prayed what you were going to say. And you're like, <laughs> right? We're not even into the prayer. This is, this is we're, 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 we're just trying not to look stupid at this point, Right? That can be prayer. There, I, 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 I know that prayer, even though we believe that we're supposed to have, that we ought to have, that it would be beneficial for us to have a prayer life, a prayer life. And again, there's two kinds of prayer. There's one where we just pray without ceasing, meaning we just are walking in the awareness of his presence and communing and talking and meditating and just being with him. In him we live and move and have our being. But then there's a prayer that we actually shut the door we, and we get about prayer and, and praying for people and praying for our nation and praying. So there's, there's both. And a lot of people don't have this one in their lives where they set aside a block of time and they actually go to God and pray. Pray for the needs of their family. Pray for the needs of their nation. Pray. Beseech God. And the reason that they don't, I don't think it's because they don't think it's important. I think, I don't really know what I'm doing. Nobody really taught me how to do that. I've heard forever that I ought to pray, but I don't really, what does that look like? What is that, what, what's the structure of that? How do I begin that? How do I, how do I, gosh, Mark, my mind wanders after 30 seconds in praying. I'm supposed to pray for like half an hour? Are you kidding me? Or 10 minutes even? And so that's what we're looking at in this series. We're looking at prayer. I want you to look at uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It's one reason that it's so very essential for the follower of Christ to pray. Paul is saying this to us. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Stop right there. How many of you already failed right there? <laughs> Me too. He's like, how? How is that possible, Paul? He says, do not be anxious about anything, but instead, in every situation by prayer and petition, everybody say those next two words, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. The result of this, the peace of God, <clears throat> which transcends understanding, shouldn't be, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
There's so much in that little passage. I could spend the whole message just talking about that. But just leave that up there for a second and look at what he's saying here. He's saying, don't be anxious about anything. And again, he knows the readers are going to say, how, how, is that, how can I possibly not be anxious about anything? My life is filled with anxieties. You have no idea the stuff that's going on with my kids, my job, my career, all of this. Be anxious about nothing. How? In every situation, every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. See, thanksgiving is that part where now it kicks in faith. It's not just, oh, God, I need you to do this. It's with thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you that you are hearing me. God, I thank you that you are going to move in this situation. And when I do that and I pray and petition with thanksgiving and I lift it up to him, my anxieties, my cares, then a peace that I shouldn't have, it transcends understanding, doesn't make sense, will guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. I hope you've had that experience because that's the one that he's inviting us to. He says, I want to give you peace for your anxieties. But we need to do a divine exchange here. We need to do, and that's what prayer is all about. So in this series, which is called Lifeline, because prayer is our lifeline to God. In this series, we're specifically looking at, his, at uh, the Lord's Prayer, what's commonly referred to as the Our Father. How many of you grew up uh, reciting the Our Father? Okay, and that's, that's wonderful. That simple phrase uh, in fact, let's look at it. Matthew 6, 9. Let's read it together. Ready? Okay, go. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That phrase right there, spoken out of the mouth of Christ about 2,000 years ago, is the most liberating and one of the most radical ideas that has ever been taught. All the books of the Old Testament, including ancient writings that were not extra biblical writings from Judaism, all the books from the beginning of Judaism, from the beginning of the lineage of the Jews, all the way to about a thousand years ago, did you know that there is not a single reference of a Jewish person addressing God directly as father? Not a single person, not a reference of this. There's a number of titles that were used by the Jewish community and families when they would pray. Uh, lots of proper phrases of respect, but the term father was not one of them. The first rabbi or teacher to ever utter that word and speak it was Jesus, to speak the term father. And it's hard for us to understand just how completely controversial that was to the Jewish audience, especially the religious leaders, when they heard this. It was an exodus from their Jewish traditions, and it is the, probably the reason that Jesus' enemies had such a hard time with him. Because he became so fam- he was speaking as though he was familiar with the omnipotent creator, and it so troubled him. See, that's the religious heart. He's God. And he's distant and he's sovereign, and he's all that. But Jesus, they, they're watching him, and he's like, yeah, he's Papa. He's father. And they couldn't take it. They didn't get it. And that's the response of religion. And then, and then, and then it got worse. Because you know what he did? He taught his followers, you say it too. <laughs> you, get to, you get to talk to him this way. Our father. It was revolutionary. Today, it's not because we've been reciting it since we were four years old. To them, it was like, can I say that? Can I really go to the God of Moses and Abraham and Isaac? Can I go to this God and say, Father? That endearing term, Father? And Jesus is saying, yeah, because you have been adopted into the family of God. You are sons and daughters. You are not servants and slaves. You are sons and daughters of God. Now, that's who we pray to. When we pray, our Father. Now, here's what I know, though. For some, maybe even some here today, the word Father is unfavorable. It's a word that carries some luggage with it. The name Father may mean to your heart disappointment. It may mean anger or abuse. Our earthly Father may have been distant, uninvolved, 
not intentional like we talked about last week. And so it can conjure up some emotions and it's not necessarily endearing to us or it doesn't necessarily draw some, there, don't raise your hand, but there may be some here today that have struggled. When I hear the word father, I cringe a bit. I want to protect myself. And I get that. I, 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 I do understand that. It's absolutely natural to have a hesitation, <clears throat> right, or an awkwardness to think about God as father if, number one, if this is just new to you, the whole following Jesus and everything, if, that, if this is a new thing for you, it might be a little awkward, and I get that. Or, number two, if the name of Father is actually a broken name for you. But here's my encouragement. I want to encourage you to, that may be your reality, but we can't just stay there. Especially those who have been struggling with this for a while, and you know, and I'll talk to somebody and say, yeah, but you don't understand, I've had a father issue. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? And I, I, I do get it, I do get it, but I've, you've been saying this for 10 years. And it's not, I'm not shaming you for that, but it's like at some point you need to exercise faith. You need to maybe trust and just hope and maybe believe and pursue that God the Father is different from anyone you have ever known, including your earthly father. Can we, can we take a chance? It's an invitation. Take a chance and allow him to re-script that name onto your heart as a good name, as a... It's a beautiful name. It's something that you only dreamed of. That's what we want to do, and that's what I want to do today. I want to spend a little time this morning. I want to look at why we can uh, confidently pray to God our Father. And then, and this is an important part too, I want to look at how to apply that practically into our lives. How can we actually go into prayer? Because as we go through the summer series on prayer, Jesus didn't just teach why we should pray, and we've all heard messages on that, why we should pray, and that's important, but also how. How do we go about actually doing that? And so I'm excited about this today. I think there's going to be some folks who go, you know what, I've never had a structure. I just kind of dive in and like, you know, how many of you have done that in like the, the Bible? I need to hear from the Lord. So you just take up, open the Bible and just like throw it and drop it and point. You know, there it is, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, you be careful because there's some weird verses in the Bible too that are just, <laughs> you'd be reading that one and go, oh, no, not that one. Let's try it again. <laughs> we can confidently pray to our Father. I want to look at this for a minute before we go into the practical application. I want to look at the why. We can confidently pray to our Father. Write this down if you're taking notes. Boy, I want you to take notes on, in this summer series. Uh, find a piece of paper, get it in your own notes page in your, in, your, in your phone or download the app and have the outline there. Why? We can confidently pray to our Father because, number one, He is a loving Father. We're just going to hit truth about who He is for a minute. He is a loving Father. God loves you. God loves me more than we will ever know, more than we will ever realize, more than we will ever, hear me, ever comprehend. We won't, we won't quite get it until we see him face to face. Here's what I believe. The life of a Christian, the life of a Christian, somebody who is actually pursuing God, is a continual awakening of God's unfathomable love. I was trying to find words for that, and I'm like, well, that's what it is to me. It's like I continually awake more to the comprehension of his love. My life with God, your life with God as a follower of Christ is, is a consecutive string of, whoa, wow, dang, man, what? It's a, it's a continual awakening, like just when I think, man, you blow me away with this, and then another thing happens, and I'm going, dang, you are good. And I think I finally got it, and then something else, and I'm like, oh, that's, it's, a, it's continual. It'll be that way for the rest of our lives. We get it. We're blown away. We think, I've never known such love. God, you're, ah, you're reckless with this, it seems, Lord. You know? I've had times with the Lord, and, and, and I'm not you know, walking around as this spiritual thing all the time. Those of you who know me say, yeah, we obviously know that about you. You're not. <clears throat> But I have had times, rich times with him where it's like, Lord, you got to stop. 
I don't know that emotionally I can take anymore. It's just you're too good. Your, your goodness is something I'm unfamiliar with, this level of love. And it's ruining me. You know, it's wrecking me inside. That's the life of a Christian. We're continually going, wow. And, and, and getting a little bit more pieces of this love that he has. The Bible says this in Psalm 103. He is like a father to us. He's tender and sympathetic to those who reverence him. He's tender, sympathetic towards you. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all of your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him. He's the father we all want because he cares for you. And that word cast, it's not like fishing where you, you know, <clears throat> you cast it out <clears throat> and then you reel it back in. That's how sometimes we are with God, aren't we? Lord, take this. God, I got it. <clears throat> Bring that right back in home, right? No, the word cast means carrying a heavy weight and handing it off. Unloading this weight onto one greater than you. Casting it off of us onto him. Why can we do that? Because he is a loving father. We're going to have to trust that at some point. We can confidently pray to our father because number two, he is a consistent father. He's consistent. He can be counted on. Isn't that good news? He, can be, he is dependable. He is reliable. He is entirely worthy of your trust. He cannot not be faithful to you. James 1.17, I love this verse. <clears throat> he says, every good and perfect gift coming down from the Father who does not change like shifting shadows. Another translation says, in whose character there is no change at all. There's a, a theological word for that called immutable. He is without change, without variation. He's consistent even when I'm inconsistent, right? He's faithful even when I am faithless. He doesn't change. My attitude, my actions, my conduct, my belief, my everything, my emotions, my accusations, my everything does not change him. He is who he is. My inconsistency doesn't Make him inconsistent. He doesn't change his thoughts about you because you had a bad day or because you feel like you disappointed him or you disappointed somebody else. He doesn't change his thoughts. He's not capricious. He doesn't, you, don't have to, you don't have to wonder what kind of mood he's in. How many of you had homes where you came home and you're like, what's going on in here now? Do I want to be seen? Do I want to hide? Right? Because you didn't, you have had maybe a father or a mother or a brother or a boss or a spouse, and you're just like, man, I can't just count on that. It's going to be okay. You're having to feel it out all the time. And I get that. That's, that's life this side. But with God, our Father, guess what, guys? And this has one, been one of the most beautiful revelations I've had over all these years is that He is so steady. That doesn't mean he's without emotion. He's passionate towards his creation. He's in love with his creation. But he's not moody. God is not in a bad mood. He's in a good mood. Because he knows the end of the story, too. <laughs> okay. Psalm 59.10. My God is changeless in his love for me. Isn't that a great revelation? My God is changeless in his love for me. All right, we can confidently pray to our Father because, and I love this, he is a present Father. He is, that means, you know what that means to you and I? He is available. He's, avail he's never too busy. He's not, he's God. It's not like, hold on, I'm, huh? can you see what I'm dealing with over here in this country? He's God. He's available to you. Psalm 145, 18. Read this with me. The Lord is near to all who call on him. He is near. 
He is never too busy, and he is compassionate to my sufferings, to my needs. He understands the frailty of our composition, and he's compassionate. He's not a get-over-it kind of God. He's compassionate to my sufferings and to my needs. Look at Psalm 34, verse 18. Read this with me. Here we go. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Does that describe anybody here today? He's close to the broken heart. He's not standing at a distance telling us to get it together. He's close to the broken hearted. He's with those who have a crushed spirit. I was thinking about that just yesterday because, um, oh, I've got a friend who is heavy on my heart right now that I'm praying for, going through some really difficult uh, stuff. And uh, I was just praying for him and praying this, Lord, you said, you know, you're, you're close to those who are crushed in spirit, and my, my buddy is right now. And so God, just I, I pray, make him, not God be close to him, he already is. Lord, make him aware of how close you are and your sympathy. And then I was thinking about see, how grateful I am that God the Father is that, that this Father that we go to in prayer, he's very compassionate towards us. He is close to the brokenhearted. Do you know the night before or the day before Jesus was turned over to the Romans and later executed? The day before, he was talking with his closest friends about his upcoming betrayal and death. So he's talking with them, and you, you, he's got these 12 that were his inner circle. And he's letting them know why, because he's about to be handed over to Romans. And he's like, okay, fellas, listen, I'm about to be betrayed. I'm about to die. I've been telling you about this. I know you don't fully get it, but I'm leaving. I'm going to die. This is for the reason I came. And then he says, and one of you are going to be the one who betrays me. Now you think about that, because he has been with them for three years, these guys. He, they have watched him selflessly minister to them in humanity to give when he's got nothing left to give. And now they're with him, and he's saying, I'm going to go. I'm going to die here. Um, one of you are going to betray me. And they are beyond sad. They are swimming in grief at this moment. And maybe they're feeling like, what, what kind of people are we? We're going to betray him? And maybe they're posturing themselves for a, a verbal whipping. Like, you know what? I've done this. You know. And what does Jesus do? He grabs a wash basin. <laughs> and then he grabs a towel and he walks over to each one of them. And he starts to wash their feet. He says, I'm with you. I love you. He washes their feet in their grief. Never mind what he's about to go through. He knows his friends are hurting. And so he washes their feet. And then after he's done washing their feet, he has his last meal with them. And he's talking with them and he's, he's doing his last teaching when he's pouring into them and saying, look, in the way that I have loved you now, you guys go love one another. And they're watching this display of their Savior, Jesus just pour out, even in his last moments, he's pouring out love to them. And one of them, Philip, Philip's like, he can't take it anymore. And he's like, he, he says to Jesus right there, he goes, Jesus, show us the Father. And that'll be enough for us. That'll be sufficient. Show us the Father. They believed he was the Messiah. They're like, show us the sovereign one. And Jesus is, says to him, Philip, have I been with you this long and you don't get it yet? Listen, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is what he's like. This is not just what I'm like. I do nothing except as a reflection of who he is. This is him washing your feet when you're grieving. When you're about to fail him, he's the one still washing your feet and inviting you for a meal. This is our God who is ever present with us and reliable 
That's the God we have. That's the Father we are praying to. The last one here is he is a powerful Father. I love that one. Our Father in heaven, he is omnipotent, which is all-powerful. He is all-powerful. Ephesians 3, 20 says, Now, glory be to God, who by his mighty power at work within us is able to do what? Far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. That is how he wants us to approach him, that I am praying to a God who is not only my father, but he is all powerful, and he's able to do exceedingly more. That's the kind of God we serve, exceedingly more than I can even ask or think. All right. So that's good news, right? All right, three of you believe me. Awesome. <laughs> that's good stuff. That's, that's who he is. That's the why. That's why we can have confidence as we go to God in prayer. Now, now I want to turn the corner here a little bit, and I want to look at what does it mean to how to incorporate that. How, does that, how can that look like in a time where I get together, when I get by myself, and it's like, okay, I'm going to spend, I'm, I'm blocking off here a half an hour or whatever it is. Uh, and I'm going to pray. There's people I need to be praying for, things I need to be praying. How does that look like? And that's what this is in, in Matthew. He says, they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. And he said, okay, this is how you should pray, not this is what you should pray. You with me? He said, this is how you should pray. And what we've got here is a, a eight phases of different ways to pray. So take notes on this part. He begins, this is where he gets practical. He begins and he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So when I go into prayer, I am beginning by acknowledging who it is that I'm praying to, right? It's not just the man upstairs. Our Father, my Father, Abba, he is my heavenly father. I am praying to my father, and here's what I know. He absolutely cares about what I am going through. He is present with me. I don't ask him to come. He is already here, and so he is near to me. So I begin, our father, my father, thank you, God. There might be, you might say something like this. Thank you, God, for being my heavenly father. God, I just want to begin by thank you for being my heavenly father. Thank you that you care about me. Thank you that I am your son. Thank you that I am your daughter. Thank you, God, that you are my heavenly father, Lord. I want to begin that way right now, my father. Then he says this, hallowed be your name. So this is before I get to giving him the shopping list, right? Before I get to praying for things that are important and things that are whatever, about my friends, about my spouse, about my finances, about my job, about that neighbor, about my child, about everything. Before I get into all that, you see, I'm still in that first phase. My father, hallowed be your name. Hallowed means your name is set apart. It's holy. Your name. I'm praying to my father whose name is great, whose name is wonderful. Names Especially in ancient times, they actually, they really, they meant something. They meant something. Names described a person. God changed Abram's name to Abraham, father of the nations. God changed Sarai, his wife, to Sarah, princess. God did this so many times in scripture. Isaac, Jacob, Benjamin, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ruth, all of their names described who they were. They were something. So names are important. When Jesus came, Jesus' name means what? Savior. They said you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Names meant something. When we pray, here's what we're doing. We're hallowing the name of God. In the Hebrew culture, the name of someone referred to his authority. His authority. This is why, hear me guys, this is why we pray in the name of Jesus. It's not a tagline. You know, I'll have people say, you didn't say in the name of Jesus. I don't know if we heard you. You better throw in, in the name of Jesus. Get, the, get that part in there, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. In his name we ask and pray, amen. 
It's not a tagline that we say our whole prayer and then just say, in the name of Jesus, amen. Now I know he heard me because I said the magic words. Some of you aren't laughing because you're like, what's the matter with that? That's what I think. <laughs> you're stepping on some sacred ground here, Mark. Well, I say it too, but it's, it's, it's with faith. We're saying in the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus has authority. So when I'm praying, like we were praying this morning or whatever, and we're, we were praying for healing, I'm asking based on the name of Jesus, God. It's in his name, Jesus' name, that we pray this prayer. He has the authority to, ask, to answer this prayer. And so God was saying, look, Jesus was saying, when you pray to your Father in heaven, he's your Father, but hallow his name. Remember who it is that you're praying to, because his name is great. I, uh, I was thinking about uh, ancient Egypt, and when Moses, this cracks me up, Moses, who's been out of Egypt now for 40 years, he's a fugitive on the run, he's wanted for murder, now God says, you got to go back. You've got to go back to Egypt. Why? Because Egypt's got all my people, Israel, in slavery, and I want them free because I have a promised inheritance for them. And you're going to be my man, Moses. You're going to go back, and you're going to lead them. And so they go through this whole thing. Him and Moses go through this whole thing, and then he finally, Moses is like, who do I say sent me? They're going to ask. They're going to ask, who's your God? What, what's his name? And this was a really big deal because the Egyptians... They had like over 2,000 gods. So they're just going to be like, well, what's your God's name? The Egyptians had over, I was writing down just a few of the Egyptian gods that they had. They had the God of sun. They had the God of justice, God of sky, God of death. They had a God of deception. They had a goddess of moisture. They had a goddess of beauty. They had a goddess of ugly. No, they didn't. They didn't have a goddess of beauty. But they did have a goddess of beauty. They had a goddess of, or a god of intellect. They had a god of fertility. You know what that god's name was? Happy. <laughs> Listen, I'm not kidding you. They also had a god of drunkenness. A god of drunkenness whose name was also Happy. <laughs> His name was not happy. They did. They had a God of drunkenness. They had a God of, oh, there's over 2,000 of them. And so Moses is saying to God, saying, who do I say sent me? They're going to want to know. How do you name yourself? Who are you? What, what God are you? And so God says, you know who I am? I am. What you got? I am. We're we talking about weather, we're talking about sun, we're talking about death, we're talking about life, we're talking about, here, I am. That's who he said I am. That's a mic drop moment from heaven right there. Who are you? I am. Boom. Issue settled. One God. He said, tell him I'm that one. There are many different names of God. But I believe, and this is something that, and I'm just, you know, I'm your pastor, so you're stuck with me. This is kind of how, how I had learned to do this over the years. I believe this. I do that. I said, practice this. This is something that I love to do. When I begin prayer time, I, I, I believe this is uh, in accordance with the way he taught. Start by saying, our father. I remind myself, my papa, you're my father. Thank you for loving me. I'm approaching you. You are approaching him, not as a beggar. Come on, guys. You're approaching him as a son or daughter. You say, Mark, I'm so bust up, though. I don't feel much like one. Me too, many times. But it doesn't mean I'm not his son. We don't get rid of our children because they're, they're having a bad day or they're being rotten for a minute or whatever else. And so it's important how you approach him in your prayer time. And you begin, Father, it's me. I love you. Thank you for loving me, even in my rebellion or my honoriness or whatever. Thank you, God, that you're listening. Now, hallowed be thy name. Here's, and here's, here's a practice I love to do, is begin to list out some of the names of God, some of the names of who he is. This is who I'm praying to. 
And I've just, I'm just going to go over. I've got like nine or so on the, on the screen here. Write them down real quick when they come up if you want. But these are, these are different names of God. And you can pray these things. I begin that, Lord, you are Elohim. You are the great God. You are the creator. And you speak that and tell him, God, you are Adonai. Adonai means you are my Lord. I, you are, I give you rule over my life. You are my Lord. You are Yahweh. And Yahweh is also you are Jehovah. You are Jehovah. You are El Shaddai. You are the Lord Almighty. This is who you are. God, you are El Roy. Now, you know what that means, that compound name of El, God? El is God and Roy who sees. This is what Hagar prayed one time. She says, does anybody see me? She's all alone in this, and, and, and he shows up, and she says, you are El Roy. You are the God who sees me in my affliction. Do you have affliction? Do you have sadness? He is El Roy to you. Tell him that. You are the God who sees me. It goes on. You are Jehovah Rapha. We prayed that this morning. You are the God who heals. This is who your name is. This is who I'm coming to today. You are Jehovah Rapha. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. You are my provider. You are Jehovah, the God who provides. And we declare that name over us. You are Jehovah Tzidkenu, which means you are my righteousness. You say, Mark, do you go through these? Yeah, many times. Yes, I do. And hallow his name, who it is I'm praying to. You are Jehovah Shalom. How many of you need peace? He is God of peace. Lord, you are the God of peace. God, I pray you would baptize me with peace today. That's who our God is. And we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and we enter into his courts with praise and we begin to hallow the name of God. And that's how we begin our prayer time. And maybe you spend just, you know, two minutes doing that. But before we get to our list of things, we come into his presence and say, Father, I just thank you. You're my son. I mean, I'm your son. I'm your daughter. God, thank you that you're near to me. God, I just bless you today. And maybe you're feeling a little funky inside. You don't feel like righteousness. You just tell him, God, you are Jehovah Sid Canoe. I'm reminding myself of your name. Your name is exalted. Your name defines who you are. It describes who you are. You are my righteousness. You are my peace. Because I'm looking in the world right now and I'm not seeing many reasons for peace. God, I say you are my Jehovah Shalom. And we begin in prayer by acknowledging that. I'm going to ask the band to come back up. And we're going to close with a wonderful song today. Does that make sense? What we're talking about here, just trying to bring some practical application. How do we begin? And what we're going to do uh, for the next six weeks or so is we're going to walk through this prayer. Next week, I'm going to be talking about your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does that mean to pray? What does that mean, kingdom come, will be done? How does that, you know, so we're going to talk about it, but then have the practical application too. Done this for years. I remember, you know, Jesus said to his disciples that night of his betrayal, he says, couldn't you pray with me just for one hour? Couldn't you just stand watch and pray with me for one hour? And they were falling asleep. Part of the thing is they didn't know how. They didn't know how. And so we want to incorporate. This will be a summer where like my prayer life took off because it had some order to it. I knew what I was doing. He is our Father. Say that word, Abba. 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 Jesus blew him away. He said, he's Abba. <laughs> and like I said, um, they were so frustrated with him that he acted so familiar. He acted so intimate with God Almighty, with El Shaddai, you know? And then he goes, oh, you think that's something? Watch, you call him that too. He's your Abba too. You're here today? He's your Abba. Would you stand with me? Our father is a good father. <laughs> He's a good father. And I hope, that's my heart's, gosh, my biggest hope for you, for me, is that we would come to understand who he really is and that we would run to this good father and you'd allow him to be that. He wants to be intricately involved in every aspect of your life. He cares about you. So Father God, we just say thank you. Thank you that you are our 
Abba, our heavenly Father. We're your sons and daughters, and we come to you not as beggars or foreigners, Lord, not strangers, but as children. And we thank you that you are near to us. Even if there's somebody here today who has that crushed spirit, Lord, that you are near to those who have that, the brokenhearted God. Somebody wondering, do you see me? We declare you are El Roy. You are the God who sees. You are the God who sees and you care. You are near. Father, help us to be aware of your presence with us this morning. We love you. Thank you for being so faithful to us. Enlarge the capacity of our hearts to receive revelation from you, God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship him with this song, and then I have an announcement for you.
Father, that your love never fails. It's unfailing. It's constant. It's consistent. You don't change your heart. You don't change your mind. You're unchangeable in your desire, in your love, in your pursuit of us. Thank you, Lord, that nothing that we do or nothing that we don't do, anything that we don't do that doesn't affect your attention, it doesn't affect your heart for us. You are so worthy of our worship. We love because you loved us first. We love because you have loved us first. Father, I pray for each and every one of us here, God, that as we move throughout this day and throughout this week, God, that that would be exactly that, like, like Mark prayed, an increased capacity to receive your love in us, an increased capacity to receive revelation from you in us. God, expand our vision. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. We ask that again and again and again and again, God because we need it we need it we love you so much continue to reveal yourself to us it's in Jesus name that we pray and we said 